Hello, Sales Hacker community. Happy Thursday. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And what are we talking about today? All right, so we are running through how to banish busy work. Uh, six moves that clear the path to closing deals. Um, you know, it's one of those things, if you ever have those days as sales professionals or sales managers, where you feel super busy all day long, but when you actually step back and kind of look at the actual results, uh, you haven't actually pushed anything uh, down the funnel. Uh, I know I've definitely been there. And today, uh, we'll try to give you some tips so that never happens again, or, or limited, limit the amount of times that happens. And before I introduce my two awesome guests that I have, uh, just a few housekeeping matters. So number one, this will be recorded. So if you have to jump off or you want to share it out with uh, a colleague, uh, we've got your back. We'll shoot it out to you uh, once we wrap up. Uh, and number two, please jump in with questions throughout the webinar. You know, we're going to be covering a lot of material, but at the end of the day, this webinar is for the community. So uh, jump in and we'll try and uh, get to as many questions as we can. All right. Now to introduce uh, these two lovely gentlemen uh, here, I'm uh, joined by Jeffrey Reekers, VP of Marketing over at Aircall, and Brandon Gracie, SVP of Sales at Handshake. Gentlemen, welcome to the community. Thanks. Thanks good to be here. Yeah, good to be here. Awesome. Happy to have you both. And as always, I do like to add just a little more color uh, to you know your careers, so people know who who's talking. And uh, we're not just floating heads up here. Uh, so we have uh, Jeff Reeker. So as mentioned, is the VP of Marketing at Aircall. Uh, you're uh, an advisor at three different uh, tech companies and have held previous positions as VP Demand Gen at Handshake, where you met Brandon over here, uh, ran marketing at Datahug, and were the COO and CMO simultaneously uh, at a company called Lawline. And we were talking about before this, something I thought was really cool. Uh, you actually started your career out at Forbes, which is super interesting. Um, and, you know, when you look at your career path, that I think if you're a marketer out there, it's, it's one that most people would aspire to. So very impressive and uh, excited to, to pick your brain today. And uh, we have Brandon Gracie as well. Uh, so uh, you are the SVP sales over at Handshake. Uh, you're actually the first commercial sales hire over there. So been instrumental in you know, the growth and can imagine the changes you've seen while you've been there. Yeah. Uh, you're also you know, the founder at Gaslight Solutions. Uh, and also advisor to many high growth uh, startups. So we kind of have the yin and the yang right now. We got the, we got the sales leader and the, the marketing leader. So uh, excited to, to see what we can, uh, insights we can pull out today. And if we can just go back quickly, I'll kind of run through the agenda. So here's what we're gonna be covering. So we've got some slides to get through. Um, and the intro we're going, uh, we're gonna run through you know, the sales velocity formula. What does that look like? Uh, kind of set the stage. Uh, from there, we're gonna move into using data to fill the top of the funnel. Uh, from there, uh, how to accelerate deals through the mid funnel, you know, keep that momentum going. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the most important, arguably the most important, actually closing the deal. Uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up with some actionable takeaways and of course some, some Q&A. Um, but that's enough of, you know, me talking, let's, uh, let's run through it. Um, and let's kick it off with the sales velocity formula. Uh, Jeff, do you want to kind of set the stage for this conversation we're going to have? Um, sure. Yeah, I can set the stage. And first off, thanks Scott for hosting the webinar and sales hacker to hosting the webinar and for Brandon. Um, it's, it's great to be, um, when Brandon and I worked together in the past and it's great to be doing some work with them, uh, made me realize how much I missed working with you <laughs> as well. Um, and tip number one before like diving into it is I'm giving this from a uh, vacation in Italy right now. And I was like 30 minutes ago, I opened up my, my slide deck to give it and I realized I forgot my charger, um, for my Mac. And so I was just praying to the Mac gods that, um, I would have like juice on the, uh, uh, on the computer. And thankfully I do. Um, but before we even think about closing sales, we should, uh, make sure bring our Mac chargers along with us. Um, <laughs> so Steve Jobs but, ghost had your back. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> He's watching right. From the left. 
Right. Um, but yeah, the sales velocity formula, if we can just hop right into um, the actual formula here, this is something as um, sales marketing professionals, I'm sure we've all seen before. Uh, but I think it's a good primer before we actually jump into the content because we're talking about how to accelerate deals through the pipeline. And um, if those out there, I'm sure, have been on revenue meetings and um, uh, revenue calls and such in the past. And at least from my experience, most of the time we're talking about one thing and that's in the top left there. And that's like the number of opportunities we have. And oftentimes we get really focused on more volume, more volume. And that's fine. That's great. Um, but it's really important to remember through this that there's other variables that um, impact the sales cycles um, or impact sales just as much. And in fact, um, um, can reveal you know, weaknesses within our, um, our sales process and our marketing process as a whole uh, if they're not optimized. And so through this and through the webinar today, we really want to be thinking about all the variables in addition to volume. And um, additionally on this, um, I always believe heavily in looking at the sales process as formulaically as possible. And these are the measurements that also not, not only go into producing a sales result, and decreasing the gap or hopefully creating, creating a, a positive margin um, on uh, what our results are against expectations. Um, but it also goes into the efficiency metrics that we have. And, and I know uh, at Aircall, for example, we're really heavily tracking um, LTV CAC ratios. And if you don't quite have that like history to be able to do that, um, uh, we're also using like CAC payback periods as well. Um, to really understand the efficiency and, and whether we're at a level that we can scale volume upon. Um, so anyways, it's a good measurement to be able to use. And just to quickly touch on each one of these three, um, first off on the um, uh, average revenue per account. And today, as we go through this, we're going to be talking about, you know, how through the sales cycle, we certainly have our ICP, but usually deals, at least my experience, and, and Brandon will probably discuss this more in his segments, you know, deals tend to like go less than what they were really expected to, whether it's through discounts or whatever that go through the sales process. So keeping those as high as possible through a better um, understanding of our ICPs and um, better, better process, better, better actual sales process is really key. Um, secondly, um, I think the next one is on win rates there. Yeah, and this is a really interesting one uh, because we can go, become so okay with like the same win rate you, at month after month after month and you just kind of accept like 20% win rate is what it is. Um, but really, I believe in having an actionable plan um, against these numbers. We want to have an actionable plan on how to increase these. And in fact, if our win rates are, are low, say they're lower than um, 50%, which one time seemed like a high number to me, but as I've gotten more experience, I realize if it's, you know, if it's lower than that, then perhaps our, our targeting and our ICP is really poor. And we want to be able to look closer at that so that we can increase that number. Um, and then the last one here around closing time, um, it, it can, this can be uncovered in some of the things we just talked about, whether it's a good fit deal or not, but it's also really understanding the customer and having a good sales negotiation process and good sales process as a whole um, and good sales staging operations. And so these are the things we really want to be thinking about. And maybe in our next you know, revenue meeting, it's not just about how we create 10x or 3x more opportunities to, to support the sales process, but how we also um, uh, improve these measurements. And so just a little bit of a primer as we go through this, it's not just about volume, but it's about all these things. We want to be thinking about these uh, as we think of the different stages, early, middle, late uh, of a sales cycle. Absolutely. And just to quickly jump in there, Jeff, because primarily uh, the sales hacker audience is, you know, uh, comes from the SaaS kind of world, SaaS tech. But for those who maybe don't live in that world, just a few acronyms there that I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so LTV, lifetime value, uh, CAC, uh, customer acquisition costs uh, and ICP would be ideal customer profile just so we're all using the same uh, same language and Scott from the sales side I think there's there's probably a good chunk of uh, folks I would imagine on the webinar who are uh, quota carrying reps and mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that Jeff just dove into that I think salespeople often have the misconception that they don't have a lot of control over is mm -hmm. uh, is just the ASP piece uh, and mm -hmm don't realize how much of an impact they can have on holding uh, things like rate card and how much that delivers, not just to the efficiencies of the business, but to, to their own performance as a rep. Uh, I think, uh, I, I'm sure everybody uh, on the webinar, uh, I, I've done it a million times myself, uh, where we sort of back down and stop negotiating because it's only a 20% discount or it's only a 15% discount. But uh, a lot of the stuff that Jeff and I are gonna go through, uh, 
I think over the next handful of slides is going to be tips and tricks and, and really tactics and strategies that reps themselves can employ on a day-to-day -day basis that allow you to hold the actual price of your product and, and speak to, sell to value, manage a sales process to value uh, in a way that, you know, if you're, let's say you're managing five deals to close a month, if you can hold $1,000 in ASP uh, above mm -hmm. what you're normally discounting to, it's going to have a $60,000 impact on your year. Like it's really meaningful on the efficiency of the business. Right. And, uh, and uh, on your overall wallet as, as, totally. the, as the rep. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, let's, let's kind of jump in uh, here. So um, this understanding uh, sales velocity. So we've looked at, you know, avoiding the trap of looking at, at purely volume. Uh, what other things do we, do we need to be looking at? Jeff, I think, I think we might have you on mute there. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, just to recap, it's about moving deals faster, winning at a higher rate, higher yeah. ACV. I mean, I think we can just hop into it at, at that. But um, yeah, just, it's just keeping in mind that there's many ways to uh, uh, increase efficiency and make us as efficient as possible in the sales marketing end. Awesome. All right. So how then at the early stage, you know, we're, we're just starting, you know, the, the life of the deal. How do we make sure we put our reps or if I am an individual rep, how do we put ourselves in a position to win? Yeah, so I can, I can start it off there. Um, and this is, first, there's three main areas, and I, I fully believe in the concept of narrowing focus first. And one thing I mentioned in, earlier on was around um, uh, win rates, 50% win rates. And I think that unless you have a very consumer-focused product or a low ACB product, uh, we really want to be trending towards 50%. We want to get to that number. That, to me, that signifies you really have a good product market fit. And every time you, you qualify a deal, uh, or a sales development rep qualifies a deal, there's a good chance of winning that. It's, it's far better from a marketing standpoint. And this, is, this, this to me is largely a marketing thing, like a targeting, your, your, um, targeting your accounts and targeting your focus. And you, you want that. And you want to have somebody like specifically in charge of that number uh, as well in the marketing. And we'll touch base on that um, a little bit later. Um, but some concepts within this that I want to touch on is... <laughs> One, and these are expectations, and I know we have largely have a sales community. So these are things that in my mind, the sales team should also be holding the marketing team accountable for and, um, and understanding what that team should be providing us as a whole. Um, so first off is we talked about the ICP, which is the ideal customer profile. And it's okay to have that, and it's good to have that. But in my experience, this, start, this stops way, way, way too soon. And you know, sometimes the process of creating an ICP is you kind of create a revenue range for the companies you like to target. Uh, maybe there's some size information in there. Um, and perhaps there's some verticalization. We like this market. We like, uh, you know, as SaaS companies and at Aircall, it's, it's anyone sort of like with the large um, uh, consumer base, large, large, high volume of customers that could be a SaaS product dialing out to many different customers. It could be um, a support team uh, with many, many customers that are, that are feeling questions from. And that's one part in knowing that. And so you can say like retail, e-commerce, SaaS, 50 to 500, and you can come up with probably a set list of accounts. And that's typically what I see happen quite a bit. Um, but I think that's really falling short of where the real opportunity is. And I think if you do that, um, you're, you're neglecting a couple things. One, um, you're first off neglecting sort of the, the, uh, um, the jobs to be done framework, which sort of looks at it from a different dimension where jobs to be done, you're really asking the question of what you're solving for the customer. And despite there might be commonalities when it comes to um, uh, the actual industry, but that's not really solving that question. It's different to say um, versus we're helping teams like yours have more impactful conversations by providing them with the information they need the moment they need it. And when you can provide somebody and you know that your customer needs real, in uh, real time information, um, and that's a big value to them, then you can work backwards and sort of create and find different pockets where real-time information is valuable to this pocket of customers, this pocket of customers. And you might connect different industries that have very similar use cases of the product as a result of that. So in addition to ICP, I'd be looking at sort of the jobs to be done profile and, and filling those two in together. And the third part of this is um, 
being extremely narrow. It's one to know the ideal customer profile, but it's, but it's more to even know sort of like the, spe the real specifics of who you're going after, who you're targeting as, as an organization. Um, in this next slide here, um, uh, Greg, if you wouldn't mind moving forward, there's a specific campaign I wanted to mention. We'll go back to the prior slide. And um, in that middle slide, what this is, is um, uh, at our call, give an example, we targeted about 400 companies that fit that space of 50 to 500 employees, um, which is our good range. They've got high volume support teams or sales teams. Um, and then we looked even further, like how, how many of those are in New York City, like right by our office? Turns out there's 400 of them right by the office. Um, and that's cool. They're in five different zip codes and there's 400 companies. So it's kind of like, why would I target anywhere else? And then the second part is like, how do they get to work? And uh, like what subway stations are around that? And so we took a look at that and we actually flagged like what subway stations were around these workplaces. And then we flagged, hey, like what is their route to work as a result? Um, and so you'll see like on the left there, there's some actual targeted like banner advertisements. And if there's ever a case for banner advertisements, there's not that many, <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, until you get too big. But here's one of them, which is like, we know their path to work every single day. Like we can intersect them. Um, yeah. And we know that they're seeing that every single day. And then on the right-hand side, like we know their address, we know their name, we know they're seeing that ad every day. We can set them a mailer that's kind of cool and it's boxed and like there's no way they're going to miss it. Um, and it follows up on the, the same sort of like campaign and hashtag that we have on the, on the print ads. The SDR calls them. It's part of the SDR campaign. Like we're sending emails, we're providing the webinars. And it's like when you know the details and have such empathy that you know your customers down to like their roots to work, then I think you've done enough work on the, the ICPN. So my advice for getting the marketing right to set the sales team for, for success is really looking as narrow as possible. Um, um, at your, not only your ideal customer, but their use cases, how they're using the product, where they are, and every detail imaginable um, on them. So that's one point. Um, if we don't mind going back to the, the prior slide, that's just one. Jeff, on that point, ask, Jeff, I feel like such a yeah. mark right now. Like it, <laughs> I love that. That was awesome. If, if you go back to that slide, uh, the upper right-hand corner is my apartment. One of those bottom <laughs> blue dots is my, my office. And yeah. about five of those red flags, I walk by every single day uh, on my way <laughs> to and from work. And we are definitely in Air Calls ICP. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I knew you were doing it to me to now see it <laughs> this, uh, this clearly is, uh, is, I expect nothing less from you. I love it. I, I was going to ask the uh, ROI on the, the campaign, but you, you probably got Brandon as a, as a customer now. from the day. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, and we won't get too far into this because we're, yeah. we, get, we get a little bit off track, but um, what, one of the, the banes of, on, on marketing, and it's looking too deeply at, like, channel return versus campaign return, and so right. you look at a campaign, and you have the ads, you've got the mailers, you've got maybe a, a, we have a target set of, um, of, um, uh, uh, of ads that run online for it as well, and you look at that right. as a campaign, and you can figure out um, as best as possible um, with right. the technology at our hands of like what the ROI of that, that campaign is. But, um, Makes sense. So this is just one avenue of a much larger campaign. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Makes yeah. sense. Love it. Cool. And then uh, the second part here that I think is important is really understanding uh, that these next two kind of go hand in hand. It's understanding moats and um, knowing the competition um, that's, um, that, you're, that you're up against before attacking. And um, I think that this is a really important one because when you know your, I'll give, I'll give an example here and the, the, the moats component, you know, in a software space, like any, almost anybody, any startup could come out there and unless you have really proprietary technology, they can come out and they can build their own whatever mm -hmm. um, and compete with you. And so you really have to think about one, like the moats that you are establishing within the organization um, and how you can be impenetrable. And, there's a lot of ways you can do this, but first off, it's, um, in my mind, attacking very narrow, back to the last slide, you got to target really narrow industries and verticals. It's far better to have a pipeline of 10 deals that are the exact same, because I know how to, I know how to create a strategy around 10 deals in the pipeline that are the exact same, versus 10 that look very, very different from one another. That's a bad scenario to be, because even if we win them, we have no leverage in the markets that we um, um, we just got into and, and there's no referenceability there so really you have to start thinking about on the, the go-to-market side creating that really strong profile and then creating consistency in the deals that you're winning so you can create an inflection and momentum in a specific vertical and then the last part to do that um, is knowing your competition before um, attacking it's great if you've done all this work but like i don't know dial pads out there and they've got 
um, a phone system that um, it, it has comparable for this individual market, and they, they've got their own go-to-market strategy going on, and then we end up competing with them. Maybe Ring Central starts launching a, a competitive you know, program um, against that same market. And so it, you have, we also have to tie this in to really detailed information, and you should have and choose, you should want um, really detailed like um, personas on all of your competitors as well, values that they have um, as best as possible. If you have your own sort of like um, um, benefits, values, feature lists, all that sort of stuff, you want the exact same for competitors, know their ICPs and understand like in this big landscape where you can be attacking. You, know, you want to think of it from like a art of war standpoint <laughs> to a degree at a big board and like where you can fit and where you can start attacking. And then I think if you've done that, um, then you can really start narrowing it down and then you have a good sort of foundation for really going to market and then getting deals like into the pipeline at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I like that point of, you know, not only defining your ICP, but looking at your competition and defining their ICP as well and seeing where those overlaps are and, and where there's maybe gaps that you can, you can address. I like yeah. I, I don't believe in like just having your, just, you know, your go to market strategy as a whole, there's this world that's moving out there. Yeah, right. it's moving fast and it's competitive and, uh, and this, all this work has to be redone, you know, it, almost on a quarterly basis because things change, right. you know, a dial pad is a competitor of ours. Like they raise 60 million bucks. Like we've got to figure out a new way and, or we've got to really monitor that and understand how it affects our go to market strategy as a whole, not be surprised by it at any point. We w you always want to be the surpriser, not be the surprise, I guess. Absolutely. I think that part about the, the evolution to Jeff is so important, right? I think the, an ICP exercise is something that an organization will do, you know, generally kind of close to day one, and then maybe we'll do again when they raise a bunch of money and then right. maybe never again. Uh, but right. like an ICP and then all the depth that you're talking about there uh, that has to live and breathe, right? It, at Handshake, it lives and breathes. I can think of, you know, I've, I've been here, depending on how you count it, about five and a half years. And, uh, I can count five or six different ISPs that we've had for each segment that we've had. Uh, and, and that's probably not enough. Uh, and, you know, we, we've gotten to a place when you talk about the understanding of the moats and sort of like maintaining that funnel, once you get to a certain level, uh, I think a lot of us think constantly about how do we fill the top? Uh, and then we'll just say, all right, well, once we get this bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, as long as we hold the percentages down, everything's going to be great. But you know, I think the real value is how do we get here and then just like hold the percentages yeah. all the way even. And uh, we at Handshake, we've um, we started about a year ago uh, as we were moving up market. We started this new committee that we call Deal Desk. And for anything that's in the upper mid market to enterprise range for us, if you have a deal as an account executive that you feel is kind of ready for prime time uh, and you feel that it's it's something that the business should invest in. You've got to walk into a room that's got our co-founders, it's got me, it's got our SVP of customer success, uh, the SDR, the account executive have to come in uh, and have to make the case for why this deal should be worked through the lens of what our ICP is, through the lens of what's going on in our prospects business, through the lens of what we currently are offering as a product and what we're going to be offering in a time frame that matters for the deal. Uh, I think most reps would consider that meeting kind of hell on earth. Uh, it's just <laughs> bombardment from every stakeholder imaginable uh, but when deals make it through we see exactly what you're talking about jeff like you go from very early stage deals that are just kind of hitting qualified and our win rates start to clip above that 50 percent that you're talking about and we just hold those deals all the way down and we win a large percentage of them because we're just working deals that fit the company that we are the product that we offer and the value we deliver yeah yeah and there's there's a part that, that trickles down to success and product there too i mean if you you, you product roadmaps issues that you know get get conflicted like it, some they'll probably happen regardless um if you're pushing yourself and closing larger deals but hopefully like if there's product roadmaps it, you, uh, compromises have to be made. It's like things that are progressive versus one offs and and For such sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I love that brandon and then also, like when, once they've, I imagine, Brandon, once the reps actually prove, you know, that this deal is then, you know, workable, they now have all those people as resources that are totally. on board because it was a team decision, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, we'll end up with, with our CMO our co and our co-founder coming over to an account executive, you know, every couple of days saying, hey, what's going on with that deal? How can I help? Yeah. I remember you said this, 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 and this about it. Let me get involved. I'm happy to talk to them. Uh, you know, our, our head of CS will come over and say, do you want an onboarding person in that call earlier than usual to talk about what it's going to be like to get on board? Yeah, everybody kind of owns the deal. Uh, and the account executive sort of walks out of that meeting with the chest puffed out. You know, it's like, 
and the rest yeah. of the team's like, oh, did you get one? You got it through? Uh, and there's <laughs> yeah. this excitement that, you know, that they've got a really good lead in their hands that has a really high chance of being a successful customer, not just a customer, but a, a successful customer here. Love it. I'm calling it right now. Handshake just made a, a new best practice that everyone's going to be following in a year. Awesome. Years time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do a webinar in a, a year and see if that prediction's at. Right. Awesome. I think it will be. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's go down uh, to number, number two. All right. All about uh, how we actually deconstruct uh, the, the deals. Yeah. I, you want me to jump in here, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we, we deconstruct, we probably don't do full like postmortems or teardowns as much as we should. And as much as I would preach to be, uh, to be honest, which is unfortunate, but uh, we, we look at, we look at the deconstruction of a deal as not something that we just do at the finish line. We're constantly doing deconstructions of all of the deals that we're working here. Uh, we actually right. do it, you know, I know a lot of teams and a lot of reps will, uh, will do things like, let's listen to a call all the way through and then let's get feedback. Um, I, was, I was at a conference a bunch of years ago where I listened to somebody walk through what their sales training was. And it was this nonstop stopping of the call as it went through where the sales trainer would stop and go, wait a minute, why'd you say that? Why'd you say it that way? Let's rewind that. Let's say that part differently. And so we, we don't just deconstruct deals. We don't just deconstruct calls. We'll literally deconstruct phrases uh, and the tone in how we're asking, uh, how we're asking questions. And then we'll talk about how a path that we went down because of a way we asked a question or because of a question we might've missed, how that elongates our sales cycle and say, okay, now we missed going here and going a little bit deeper on this piece of the ROI story. When did we end up getting it? And then the answer will be three calls later. Okay, well, if we had gotten it here now, let's pretend that we had gotten it earlier and let's talk about what would have happened to the deal at that point. Uh, and so there's, you know, it's probably almost reinforcing an insecurity on every call that there's more that we can learn uh, and it encourages us. I think, you know, when I think about compressing sales cycles and think about moving deals downfield faster. The number one way to do it kind of thematically across all of all of this stuff is just think about your customers, stop thinking about yourself. And if we're doing that more in calls and, and we're coaching ourselves, you know, our reps here will do it uh, with or without me. It doesn't matter if I show up to the meeting, uh, they'll do it one off uh, when they hear each other on a call, you know, it's become part of our culture to constantly dissect all of the things that we're saying. Uh, and what it leads into is it leads into those like those high speed, high value deals, right? Say, Great. Very early on, we got this here because we asked a question a certain way. It allowed us to hold the, de the deal size. Uh, it allowed us to skip, you know, skip what could have been three or four extra calls to get the same uh, piece of the pie. Uh, and, and it ultimately just held the integrity of the deal. And that becomes kind of endemic, right? And it starts becoming a way everybody's doing things. So uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in deconstructing deals in and of themselves. And like, I'm, I, I don't practice what I preach as much as I should here, but we over practice what, what I preach on deconstructing the segments of every given deal. Got it. So segments meaning, meaning like every, so every conversation you guys are using, I assume some sort of like conversation intelligence platform yep. to do so. Yeah, yeah, we use, we use chorus uh, and, uh, and we'll, you know, we use it on uh, the, the closing side. We use it on the customer success side as well. Uh, we, we give access to it organizationally. Like we're big believers that a sales conversation belongs to the business, not to, not to one person or the person who happened to be on it. Uh, yeah. And there's, you know, there's a million reasons to do that, but um, least of uh, not least of all is that it creates questions, right? Like why, you know, somebody from customer success, somebody from product coming to us and saying, Hey, when you ask this question, why, what were you aiming at can help us develop the product better. It can help us mm -hmm. change the way we onboard. It can help us, you know, with feedback coming from those departments, it can help us shift the way we actually sell the value and the state of the product. And so um, mm -hmm. we're, we're constantly thinking about this. I, I recently, uh, I interviewed uh, somebody to join our team for SDR and he told me one of his hobbies was uh, he does like uh, open mic nights at uh, comedy, uh, comedy clubs around New York. Nice. And he got me when he said, uh, yeah, I record all of my sets and then I listen to how people laugh. Uh, not just did they laugh, but I listen to like, what is, what is the kind of laugh I'm getting out of every joke? And I said, oh, you're going to be a great fit here, man. Like that's, that's exactly what we're, what we're talking about. So um, we deconstruct literally everything we do uh, in an aim yeah. to just continuously shave time off of our sales cycles. That's awesome. You know, it's, it, it's, um, it's interesting. I had, um, I was speaking with, um, a, a, 
uh, Preston Clark, who Brandon and I know, um, you know as well. Yeah. Um, at um, when we both we all got together um, about a month and a half ago, and he was saying some of his top sales reps is not something we do really uh, or have a discipline around it at um, at Air Call, which is um, a shame. It's something we should be putting in. But he was saying his top sales reps, like when they lose a deal. Um, they're calling the prospect the next day. They don't want the deal back, but they're just like obsessed with why did I lose it? Like what, what questions didn't I ask? At what point did it go wrong? Um, like get more information. How, why did you choose what you did choose? And like just trying to get as much information possible so that next time through, um, you know, you, you, you've got a better shot. At least you have more info around it. So it's, uh, um, it's, um, it's, an, it's an amazing concept that um, you've, that's this awesome. is sort of like a new thing that I never really thought about is, is like deconstructing the lost deals. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That was actually something at one of my past employers we, we had to do. That was like, if you, if you lost the deal, you had to go and, and find out exactly why so that we could not only learn better as a, a sales rep, but also uh, basically democratize the knowledge of like where we fell short throughout the whole organization. It's a, it's a good path to go down for sure. I just wrote that down. I'm going to steal that. That's my tip and trick that I'm taking from this webinar. <laughs> I'm going to start calling the deals that we lose and just say, hey, I'm sorry, we haven't spoken before, but uh, we yeah. just didn't listen to this. Why? It, also, it, it sets you up. These things are renew, renewals, right? So if you totally. come in, Mr. Nice Guy, be like, I just want to, you know, get our prospects, you know, happier and like build a better business. And hey, we'll, we'll also talk in a year. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Uh, moving on, Jeff, getting your uh, uh, anything to add here on the deconstructing deals or should we move on to mid stage? No, I mean, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's great practice. It's, it's a great reminder to me as well that um, like, this is something that is, it should be as mandatory as like having sales stages or whatever. And so it's the operational process. Totally. Absolutely. All right. So moving through uh, now in kind of the mid stage where we need to keep that momentum going. Uh, I know a lot of deals get, you know, stuck here um, after they're qualified, you've done the demo and now you're kind of need to keep it going. So how do we keep these mo deals moving down uh, the pipeline quickly? Yeah. So I think um, just to start on the marketing end, we can call these creating tailwinds. Um, but <laughs> I think all too often the thing that we see here that happens if you have a deal that's sort of mid stage or early, even early mid stage um, is that you sort of turn off the marketing nozzle because one is maybe the marketing team isn't, isn't um, uh, it, you know, they aren't compensated for that. Or that's not their goals or goals are leads. Um, and two is perhaps sales reps. Like once it's in their hands, they don't want anybody touching it. And rightfully so. If they don't have confidence, they don't want anybody touching the deal. Just let me do my thing and let me close, close the deal. Um, but um, I really believe that this is like the most critical stage that we can be doing marketing. I mean, if you, there is nobody better that's in market. You've already established and qualified the opportunity. It's gone, if it's gone through deal desk, you know, it's a great opportunity. Um, and you have like, it's like having a set list of accounts, but it's much further down the sales cycle. Um, mm -hmm. And so first off, if you're a marketing team, I fully believe that marketing teams need to be fully aligned with sales, the, the sales team and have a shared, uh, at least part of their compensation of targets have to be tied into um, closed deals and to revenue. If it's not, then it's too easy for the marketing team to just turn off um, what they do at this stage. Um, and Secondly, I think because you have a narrow market here, there's tons of opportunities that you have on the marketing end. And really the core goal that you have here is to establish your company as the clear choice above all competitors. And so if, shoot, if I have 100 companies, say in the pipeline at a given moment, and whatever that number is, then I want to be investing more marketing dollars in there. I may not have, maybe I have a targeted uh, or a set budget for that. Maybe I don't. But if I have, um, if I took all my marketing dollars, like that's the area I want to focus on because that's where we have a real opportunity to win those deals. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of more creative things that I think we don't think about on the marketing end, or maybe it's on the sales end. We don't expect from our marketing team because we just want the leads, but really we want to be establishing ourselves um, uh, extremely high um, in the, um, in the buyer's mind. Uh, and so one thing that I really believe in, because it's difficult to get this started, right? Because you, you don't want to divert attention from the lead gen component, but you still want like some A, enablement, and then B, like actual validation uh, to the customer. And so one thing I believe in is having, and I'm stealing this from um, 
um, somebody else, VP of marketing at, uh, at Front, um, who I was talking with uh, about this a few weeks ago, and she had stated that they have somebody that is full, and we're, we're definitely stealing this idea, <laughs> and they have somebody that's fully dedicated yeah, that um, sits outside the product marketing team. Um, that is just for sales enablement and their post opportunity creation and they just focus on how to help salespeople close deals faster and that's it they're a resource for that team they're a reactive when it's necessary hopefully that's not necessary quite so much but they are uh, when it's necessary to create like a tailored ROI um, case study or something like that and then B um, they're creating in advance like they're making sure that the features are trained properly they're making sure that everybody uh, um, on the sales team has all the, the content and the case studies that are relevant to helping to close the deal. Uh, and so one thing I believe in is, is having that, um, that resource. I think I touched on that a bit more in the, in the last part, but it's definitely like pertinent here in the middle stage as well, because you want to have somebody that's staffed and, and ready to go. Um, and then additionally on the actual advertising spend, this is where it's like, it's gold. You know, if I have a hundred accounts um, and maybe on the sales side on those opportunities, I have three contacts per account, something like that, four contacts, people that are associated with the deal. But if I have a product that maybe the entire sales team rolls out, why, why wouldn't I have all those contacts, the contact info for everybody on that team? And if I get the contact info for everybody on that team, I should upload them to all my digital ad campaigns. Like they're all seeing my ads on whatever site they're going to on, on, via ad rule or whatever, like a retargeting platform uh, or CRM retargeting. Um, I'm sending them mailers. Like if the, the deal is stuck, I'm sending them, uh, Brandon, I know we use something at Handshake and we've used it here at Aircall called, um, called like One Hope Wine, which sends out like on demand uh, little gifts uh, with notes attached to them that they give to a charity that somebody has, um, you know, a relationship towards. Um, uh, I'm mapping those accounts and like creating custom content for them. Um, and one thing that we've done in the past is um, if we have a webinar, for example, and we talk about uh, implementing your phone system into uh, or how to get the most out of your phone system and say out of Salesforce or something like that. And we've got a late stage opportunity, a mid to late stage opportunity. We know like they're having trouble with a competitor who has a horrible Salesforce integration specifically, like they're not getting the analytics that they need. Like you better believe that we're going to be focusing that next webinar with analytics as a portion of that. We're going to yeah. comp a sales uh, SDR to get 10 people from that company on that webinar. And we're going to talk about their pain point really specifically on what seems to be a webinar for like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, which it is to a degree, but really we're like tailoring it towards that opportunity um, and assuring that they're attending on it um, and that they're getting that sort of like thought leadership from us. Um, and there's like a ton of other tactics that we could talk about, I guess, at this stage. But I guess the overall theme is um, when a deal gets into late stage, it gets qualified and you know it's a good deal and you need to push it towards, um, towards close. Do not like hold back on the marketing end. You want to be investing more in understanding how to make your company the clear choice uh, outside of all the competitors. Uh, and you want people staffed. They specifically, they specifically have that objective and they might have um, a win rate target, something like that as a part of their compensation bonus. Um, and you want to be investing very heavily in getting those down the line on the marketing side. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I just wrote another awesome takeaway. I, I can't believe that's not a actual title. If people are looking to boost win rates, having like a marketing sales enablement person who's just focused like post opportunity, I think that's, that's genius. I like that a lot. Yeah. And there's, there's some cool tech to help enable this too. We just, um, um, uh, purchased something called demand base, which is, um, mm -hmm. th they run a great sales process themselves. I learned a lot from just going through their sales process. Um, but, um, you know, like if, if you have a mid-stage opportunity, they come to the website, why would I show that opportunity? Uh, why would I show that lead, um, uh, request demo? button. They don't need to request a demo. Like I want to create a unique experience for them. That's a yep. little bit different. And I want to know who they are when they come to the website. And I want like everything A to Z to be unique for them. I haven't quite built that out yet, but that's like yeah, internally, that's, it's like mission critical item for us the second half of the year. Making sure we have a really strong strategy, uh, customizing, customizing that experience. Awesome. And Brandon, so all this stuff, it sounds kind of like a, you know, a salesperson's dream if they're thinking like a quarterback. But, you know, as Jeff said, some salespeople are like, you know, very worried and they want to just run their own thing. They know it works. How do you encourage, you know, alignment at Handshake and, and make sure that you're 
your reps are comfortable with uh, marketing, you know, staying well into the cycle? Uh, I mean, at this point, we encourage it. We don't have to. It works, right? I mean, you know, Jeff helped lay the foundation for that when, when he was here with us. And, you know, we've, our marketing team and our sales team sit literally directly next to each other. Our sales team, uh, or our marketing, uh, members of the marketing team will come join like call downs once a week uh, and actually like work, uh, work down a list and be a, you know, we call it a guest DR uh, for, for a couple of hours a week. So they're constantly, they're close to the role and they understand the empathy, you know, or they have empathy for, for what goes into it. And so they quickly win the trust of the team doing things like that. Uh, and then uh, our, our marketing team delivers, you know, they, they deliver on what they're learning. And so the sales team wants them in the conversation. You know, we, we went through uh, recently a pretty deep micro segmentation exercise where we said, okay, well, there's these sort of broad segments that we work in. Let's get really weird and really narrow here. Right. And like, we got to like, Honey companies are a really specifically high converting industry for us. Companies that just make honey, right? You would think that there's like 11 of them in the world, but there isn't. There's, there's more than you can possibly count. Uh, and our marketing team, you know, took a look at the data that said we're, we're, we're qualifying and winning a lot of business in this very narrow segment. Uh, and then went and talked to all of the reps and said, hey, tell me about this opportunity that you worked. Let me listen to the call. What was really interesting about it? Uh, and then they start writing campaigns that are very, very targeted at that, right? And then we start to get more and more of our lead uh, flow coming in with very specific and very narrow use cases that we can speak to very deeply. And our salespeople are going, well, this is, you know, on some level, it's almost fish in a barrel because when I'm talking to honey companies, they look at us and they say, wow, I can't believe how well you understand our very small niche industry. And mm -hmm we want to work with you. Uh, and, you know, we've done that with a ton of different small industries and we're, you know, we're starting to get all of these very, very deep pockets of places where uh, handshake is essentially, you know, the market leader for honey companies that need e-commerce. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know how we originally did it. Uh, you know, Jeff would, Jeff would be better, uh, better to probably tell that war story. Uh, I, I tend to forget the battles once they're, once they're won or lost. Um, but he and I fought through that once upon a time, a bunch of years ago, but, um, because he delivered and because the team continues to deliver on it, um, it works. Awesome. So just essentially showing them success. And once they see success, any, yeah. any reps, gonna, if, it, if it boosts their win rate, they're going to start, uh, start adopting. That was much more elegant and concise, yeah. <laughs> um, I do have another, I'm, I'm going to grill you with another question here, Brandon, because we go quickly to the community because we've got cool. some good uh, questions here. So we've got a question from Emmanuel. Thank you for the question, Emmanuel. Uh, so question is, there are occasions in which I start very strong. Uh, my client is excited about the deal, uh, but the next steps lose strength. Uh, when I call or email a second or usually third time in order to, you know, lock it down, uh, it loses momentum. How can I stay uh, top, of, top of mind and, and maintain uh, relevancy? Uh Manuel, outrageously timely question uh, relative to our slide deck here. Um, so and this was this is this is a real Emmanuel <laughs> Putra is a real person. This isn't this is a time. I believe deck. it. I, I believe <laughs> it because it's you know, uh, Emmanuel, you're not the only person who has that, right? Every every account executive everywhere has it. Even the ones who do what we're what we're going to talk about right now. Um, next steps are are particularly difficult to put in place iteratively uh, and. That's because, you know, the story of how an evaluation is going to go changes as things go on. And if you're constantly kind of trying to retrofit in all these steps that you learn about and trying to, uh, to build the plane mid-flight, so to speak, uh, it's, it gets really challenging. And, you know, think about your prospect if they're on the other side of that and it's just this account executive or this, you know, probably what the thing is just this salesperson is berating me and they're constantly calling me. I don't know what they want. They're going to ask me a question that I... I don't have the answer to and I'm gonna to have to go figure it out uh, and I don't think I owe them anything and so the reason that you start strong and then things start to weaken as you go down the path is because you haven't mapped out what it's going to look like for your prospects before you start uh, I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that wherever you're a salesperson you are an expert in how people buy that product none of your prospects are uh, and, and we have to remember that particularly as, as sellers, uh, and you, you need to speak about that authoritatively, uh, and you need to speak about it very honestly and very directly. You know, we, we sell a technically 
large product here and there are a lot of steps involved with evaluating it and trying to put those into a process mid process uh, and say to you know somebody on the business side who thinks they're pretty close to deciding that we want to move forward and now saying cool now go get your entire technical team involved uh, and then you're going to want to get your marketing team involved because there's going to be an adoption question that we're going to want to answer for it's mm -hmm. you know, for people who think they're at the finish line. It's really, uh, it's really challenging. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a new convert, uh, to, to putting mutual success plans in place. Some places call them mutual action plans and mutual close plans. Um, and you know, they all sort of serve the same thing. Uh, we're one of our, uh, venture partners is uh, emergence capital and Doug Landis, uh, who's the growth partner there. Uh, he came and did a session with our team uh, about this and it was outrageously valuable. And it is about, at the outset saying, this is how people evaluate and purchase our product. These are the steps that they go through. Who from your side needs to be involved in each of these steps? Like, let's actually map these out one by one by one. We leave 15 minutes at the back end of our first call to go through this. And we don't get it all, but we get a lot of it. And, and we also make it really, really clear to our prospects. That this is a project. Evaluating our solution is going to be a project. And, uh, and if you're if at the moment when you're most excited, right, you know, a couple hours after you clicked demo request, uh, when you are in the middle of a, a discovery call where you're talking about your pain and your problem with somebody who gets it and wants to solve for it, if at that moment you're not willing to build a plan to solve your problem, you're not going to actually solve your problem. Uh, and so we, we've gotten, we're, I should say we're getting militant about this. Uh, it's, it's a painful thing to put in place because it's hard to do, even for salespeople. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Emmanuel, this is, this is why I would guess you're running into challenges there is that, um, your, your prospects don't know what your middle stages look like. Uh, and, uh, and you haven't, you haven't made it clear to them that it's a project to evaluate you, your product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, an awesome, awesome answer there. And just to take that a step further. So when you're building out that, uh, you know, mutual action plan. Are you actually assigning like dates to each yeah. one of those roles? Yeah. Yeah. And where, where we start is when do you want to be live? Right. We, yeah. you know, in a, in a perfect world, do you, do you have a trade show coming up? Do you have a sales meeting coming up? Do you have some catalyst going on in your business? Great. Let's start there. Based on what we know, we're talking 30 days implementation. So you've, you've got to be through legal. You've got to be through everything by 30 days before that. And then we get to a date when you have to say yes. We go, okay. Now we've got four weeks. You thought you had four months, but we've got four weeks. Let's talk about the people who generally need to get involved, the sequence we see it happen, and let's talk hard dates. We can change them as we go, and we, we usually do. Uh, we leave room to add things in, but we'll say, you know, all right, you don't want to tell us all of the people's names who are involved. Tell us the roles. Tell us gender. Let's put a placeholder in here for we're going to need to bring somebody in from the executive team. We're going to bring, need to bring somebody in from the IT team. Uh, mm -hmm. And then... Uh, you know, we do it, we literally do it in a Google doc that we then share with them. So they have ownership over and our prospects can make changes in there. They can add to it. They can put new notes. When we miss a date, we put that link in an email and we send it over and we say, Hey, just want to make sure that you understand that we've missed a date in our plan here. It doesn't have to push things off, but it could. So let's talk about this. Like, are we still on, on track here? Uh, can we compress a couple of these other steps that are in, uh, in the plan and still make this happen? Uh, mm -hmm. And and we don't say it in a way that's, hey, you owe this to us. You promised us. You told us. Uh, because we started at when do you want to be live and moved back from there, saying this is just the plan you and I think makes the most sense for you to get what you want in the time frame that you want. Uh, and then we're talking about goals. Right? We're not talking about buying software. We're talking about like, we want to change your business by this date. This is how. That's uh, sorry. That's that's like that's overwhelming to me. That's, <laughs> that's I mean that's amazing. I think thinking yeah. about that, I, one thing that we have trouble with, I'm sure a lot of companies do, is that deals just you, you sort of have an arbitrary close date on it on what your sales cycle looks based off of what your sales cycle is, and um, hopefully it closes in that date. And you know, we like we look at win rates and such, but like, deals push so much. Of course, and. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to come at it from the perspective of um, identifying to the prospect when they have to go live by, like informing them and teaching them along that, that path. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really interesting concept that it almost creates its own urgency within it as well. Totally. Yeah. And it's not salesman urgency, you know, uh, no. right, right. We, we, 
we're one way or another from here to forever, salespeople are going to be saddled with, you know, a specific uh, set of presumptions about us. And as, as much as we can lean away from that and lean into, we're here to help you solve a problem that you're telling us is a problem in a time frame that you care about. Like, this is your plan. I'm just the consultant who's here to help you work through it. Um, as much as we can do that and do it in a sincere way, right? It's not BS. Um, uh, the, I wouldn't say the easier our job gets, but the more predictable it gets. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and the shorter the sales cycles become to sort of the point of the conversation at large. Mm -hmm. I love when, it. Do, when do you start architecting that plan? Is it after, after what, what stage? Is it after the deal is qualified? Is that when you, you tend to start creating a mutual success plan? Yeah, we, we do it once we understand what the pain is. You know, we, uh -huh. You know, one of your one of the earlier slides uh, you talked about, you know, kind of going way, way deeper than ICP, we, we've got the four handshake whys, right? Like if our prospect identifies one of the whys uh, as, a, as a business challenge for them, once we get that and we've crafted some degree of an ROI story, then and only then do we really show a demo. Uh, and once we get into that demo, you know, our, our first call deck is, uh, it's about what we've learned about them, the business problems that we think that, that they have, how we think we might be able to help them. Uh, then we go into who we are, then we show the deck, but right in the agenda, or then we show the product rather, right in the agenda to kick things off, we say, and we're going to reserve 15 minutes at the end of this call to talk about the plan forward. Uh, we don't just say like, we're going to talk next steps because then everybody knows that they just have to tell you, yeah, I'll show up to a call on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, we say, we were going to talk about the plan and it's going to be arduous. We're going to show you an example of what it looks like and it's big and it's gnarly and you're going to have to commit to people and resources, uh, but you're going to have to commit a lot more people and resources to going live. So this is the plan. And uh, we're, we don't, we don't generally have a ton of pushback. We have some, but like, you know, to kind of go back to what I said earlier to the people who push back on it, if they're going to push back to actually entering into an evaluation, like a real plan to figure out uh, if, if they want to move forward with us, which is never going to get to yes anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. And then you're just the whole experience of that, you know, it becomes so much more collaborative. You're then a guide, you know, helping them navigate. Be like, listen, I've done this a hundred plus times. We're going to get this roadblock. These people are going to get involved. Mm -hmm. Your CFO is going to be angry at this. And, and here totally. is what we're going to need to do together. And then you become a team working to towards implementation versus a salesperson trying to sell his software. Sure. I love it. All right. So let's, let's keep uh, moving along. Uh, down the down the line here uh so get to now late stage uh solutions so uh this is when you know you're now head to head probably a competitive deal this is very late stages uh what are some battle tested moves uh to get those deals uh over the line get them to sign on that dotted line yeah i'll i'll be real brief on this and i think i think the real magic is mainly on the um the sales side here and the real insights that um, that, we, that we crave but uh but um the um the part for for the sale or on the marketing side i would say um and the, there's a couple main ones first off um i think having that one resource is going to be a real critical component to the sales cycle here at the at the end stages like when you're going up against a deal that's this is when like i don't know some crazy use case some new person that you've never had on the deal comes out of left field and demands x y and z and you've got like a crazy date against you to get it done and having like the dedicated resource is going to be a really big asset for the organization here um and then i also think on the marketing side we want to think about how we can make every deal easier that we get in the future uh, and so I think the best thing that on the marketing side you can be doing is thinking about next time we have this deal in the sales cycle, how do we win it even easier? Uh, and I think there's a couple things that we want to be doing um, as a part of that. First off, um, we want to be setting up somebody for um, uh, measuring the impact that they're going to have once they're a customer. And so if your marketing team is really strongly involved in this at the end of the sale, you want to be putting into the end of the sales process or product possibly the early um, success portion or the early onboarding portion. Like what are the key like success metrics that are, that are going to be defined uh, post implementation? Do you want the pre your Sasco product world and like the post your, your, your product world? You want to know what those measurements are um, and um, you want to know and be able to track how they're um, affecting or how they're being impacted on the team um, three, six, nine, 12 months down the line so that your success team has an easier time on their QBRs. And so that A, uh, B, you can also set up good case studies that you can use um, um, down the line. And so that next deal is easier and you increase your relevancy. And then B, it just becomes better 
uh, or C, it becomes easier to renew that customer when the time comes. Like remember prior, like here's what we've done for you. And if you don't have that from the onset and you just think about closing the deal, um, then uh, you're losing a really strong renewal component and you're really, uh, a really strong marketing component uh, that can help source more customers like that. Um, and this is arguably multiple teams that's a part of this, but somebody has to take ownership, make sure that that happens. You have to know um, the results that you're driving for the customer. Um, and then I'd say in addition to that, and perhaps an enable, uh, something that, that enables that to happen, uh, is creating a really strong community uh, that's bigger than the product. I, I don't think we've yet sort of created this at Aircall, um, but I think of brands like Marketo or um, uh, Salesforce is a very obvious one. I think Zero does a good job of this. And you know, you, you know there's a good one because um, if you go online and you search for like blank developer, you're going to see like a, a Marketo implementation specialist, something yeah. like that. Like there's strong communities around right. these products they're oftentimes like platform products, but they don't have to be. That's where that sort of specialist comes from. But there's big communities a part of it. And like, if you're a Marketo customer, like you, you don't just use Marketo at that company. Like you go to your next company and you bring it there. And then you go to your next company and you bring it there. Uh, and when you become part of that, like you become part of that user group. Like they started buying you to their, their events and their conferences. You get like potential speaking engagements. Uh, when I first became a Marketo customer, they invited me to their CMO summit. It was amazing. Like there's the, the CMO at IBM over there. <laughs> there's so many value adds to that that are beyond the product itself. And when you can really start driving community, this is a very long haul thing, but we want to start thinking about it early. Um, you can sort of create something that's bigger than the product itself and a movement that's bigger than the product itself. And so you want to start thinking about that. And that's what can really help drive like a late stage deal it's because you, can, you become part of something and you can get your customer to feel that um, all the better. Absolutely. And again, it's, just a, it's, just, it's a big initiative, but I think yeah. you want to have a goal as a marketing staff to like build that out over time. If, if not, um, then what are you building essentially? Totally. I feel very, 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 very strongly about that last piece there, creating a community. Obviously, Sales Hacker, we built a community. Our business is community. And I think SaaS companies yeah, in particular, yeah, yeah. going back to what you were saying before about, you know, SaaS companies are becoming a commodity. Anyone can jump in your space and, and build a product. But if you can create yeah. that community and that value that, that comes from more than just your product, that's how, you know, you build those moats, right? That can yeah. be one of your moats is this, is this value that you bring because, you know, all these tools do so much now, but it's as strong as implementation and how you, how you use it and, and actually do it in your internal organization. So building that community and value is. Well, is yeah. And, and, and frankly, like I sales hacker is a great example. I mean, you guys were a community first essentially. Um, and then yeah. built out products on top of that. And mm -hmm. to me, like having air calls as a part of sales hacker, it's like you become part of a community. And so yeah. Uh, I don't know, you guys do webinars, like whatever the medium is. It's just being, becoming part of that community, which is valuable. Um, Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting um, component to start building out. Totally. All right, and keeping it, keeping it flowing, we do have one more, uh, all right, mapping out every scenario. Brandon, you're, you're tackling this one, correct? Yeah, I, so I, I, I mean, this is, the, this is kind of the oldest adage in sales, right? It's uh, expect the yes and prepare for the no. Um, but we start this in deal reviews, like very early stage deal reviews. We say, I don't care why uh, an account executive thinks they're going to win a deal. I know they know why they, th they think they're going to win the deal. Uh, one of the questions we ask constantly is, uh, why do you lose this deal? Tell me every reason you lose this deal. Uh, and let's map out all the reasons you lose the deal. Now let's talk about how we stack up against competitions relative to those reasons that we lose the deal and no decisions competition to. Uh, and let's talk about how we're going to talk through each and every one of these scenarios. How are we actually going to bend this conversation either back to a strength of ours or neutralize, neutralize a weakness of ours so that our negotiation isn't just, cool, we'll give you a couple months for free and we'll give you 20% off and a handful of free users. Uh, and uh, I, I speak in, in metaphors and I tell stories that are very roundabout ways of making my point way, way too often. Uh, but um, I talk about this guy, Alex Honnold, a lot, who's a rock climber, uh, who's He's a free solo rock climber, which means he, he climbs giant walls with no ropes and no gear whatsoever. Uh, and last year he climbed El Capitan in Yosemite. It's like 3000 feet. Uh, he climbed it in four hours. The first time somebody climbed it, it took 47 days. Uh, he did it with just a bag of chalk, right? Like at any point he could have fallen and it's over and he didn't. Um, and he talks about, and, I, and I've heard other people talk about the way he practices for every single thing that could happen. 
and he'll practice until he can't move his arms uh, because he can't like actually hold his weight. And, and then I heard uh, this, the story of people who see him in the meadows below the walls that he wants to climb. And he's just sort of like moving his hands around like this. And people will go up to him and go, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm practicing the, the climb. I'm practicing for when I get to this one pitch. And uh, I think, you know, mapping out the entire negotiation beforehand is it's doing that. It's constantly doing that always, always be practicing and be pessimistic about what could go sideways in any deal that you're working. And if you do that, you'll be able to climb 3000 foot walls without a rope. Uh, and it's because you, you don't get into a situation where you're shooting from the hip, right? You're just prepared no matter what they say, you've already mapped out what to say. Uh, and, and I'll say to, to uh, members of our team, like, go in the bathroom and say it into the mirror. Like, go practice saying it, go sit in a conference room by yourself and practice saying it. Don't just think the things you're going to say. Uh, actually say them out loud. So when they come out of your mouth with the prospect, it's not the first time you've said it. Uh, and uh, mapping out everything that you could have to say, everything that could go right or wrong, is just a critical, important, uh, critical part of not having the last part of your deal be the longest part of your deal. Um, you know, knowing your walk away number, this is a thing that uh, John Barrows talks about a ton. Uh, I love this, right? Like, don't go into a call thinking like, yeah, we're going to make it work. We're going to find a number. Go into a call, having negotiated everything beforehand in your head, knowing where you're going to go, be prepared, and know the number that you just say no to. Uh, mm -hmm. And remember that your prospect is negotiating as well, right? Like we, we do a book club uh, here at Handshake for the salespeople, and we're reading this book, Never Split the Difference right now. And one of the things that we talked about uh, this morning in book club was like, your, your prospect has to find a solution just as much as you have to hit your number. And keep that in mind. You don't have to just back into where they started. And having your walkaway number in mind is a really effective way to just say, we can't do this. I think this is a fair deal that we're offering you. Uh, and we just can't go any lower. Uh, and that is almost never the end of the conversation. Uh, and so uh, absolutely knowing that. And don't let legal lose a deal. I mean, this is super, uh, super self-explanatory. The easiest possible way to not let legal lose a deal is when you're building that mutual success plan early on. Find out if legal is going to be involved and don't ask like theoretically, right? So we'll say the well, last time you bought a piece of software, when did legal get involved? And that way we're getting a very specific answer and say, okay, cool. And how long did it take? And say 30 days or 60 days. All right. Well, we've got a 30 day sales cycle here. We're going to send you our contract now when you feel comfortable, send over, like it's not going to have terms, it's not going to have, you know, prices or anything like that. Send it over to legal now so they can start reviewing it. These things don't have to happen one after another, they can happen in concert so that all ships land at the same time. I think it's one of the most effective things you can do relative to not letting legal get in the way. Absolutely. All yes. excellent points and never split the dis difference. Chris Voss, amazing book. Yeah, Everyone for sure. Go read it. I, I, I love that, that walk away number concept. It's that, um, um, I have experience on, on both ends with it, you know, like buying software. I've been in scenarios where I've, I knew other people that had a, sp a specific software. I won't use the name of it. Um, I knew they had a good price. Like I, they had me, I asked them to send over that quote to me, which was like 50% of the price and something they probably would never offer um, anybody else. Uh, they sent it to me. Like I sent it to the, the salesperson. Like, what well, you know, what, what's up? Why can't I get this? That sort of thing. We ended up getting it. And it like, it's not just that one scenario oftentimes. Like that sort of thing becomes your reputation. Mm -hmm. um, as well on the flip side i know we've sold deals that you know like well, let's just get it done and move on and like offer them whatever the ridiculous price is that they want it's the end of the quarter requested. or whatever sure we'll take yeah, it right yeah right yes. right that becomes and, part of your reputation too yeah right absolutely right. and uh guys i'm doing a ter terrible job moderating because we are now three minutes over so uh we just so many good takeaways and tidbits i i wish we could do this uh all day but let's run through kind of the the key takeaways. And Jeff, do you want to run through some of these uh, key takeaways here? Sure. I mean, we'll just breeze through them quick. Um, yeah. Early stage, um, just, just think about like the targeting, really narrowing down the ideal customer profile. And then once you've got that, like on the sales side, also be de deconstructing deals. This is um, a phenomenal takeaway that I have here. And, and um, not only the, like, the deals you're winning, but also um, deals mm -hmm. that, that you've lost and understanding every single reason why so that you can improve um, the next time through. Uh, Mid-stage, creating um, uh, tailwinds, like don't let up on marketing here, invest more. Developing mutual success plan on the sales side. 
uh, which is something I really want to look into. I love that concept of a shared um, document that you have, like a shared success plan uh, with a prospect. It's, it's really interesting thinking about it from the consultative end. Uh, and then last, like have that dedicated sales resource uh, and be thinking about how to add more value to the product than just the product itself as part of a community that's overall. Um, and then finally, and sort of the theme that, that's behind this a lot is map negotiation and really know all the details, like have everything choreographed and, and really know the details behind um, everything as Brandon had stated. Um, but yeah, those are, those are some key awesome. takeaways. Hopefully they're good things and you took some takeaways here that um, were helpful for either the current month or the current quarter or um, potentially the second half of the year that actually can help move some deals down the line. Absolutely. And I know personally, this webinar, I've, I've got probably the most notes I've had uh, out of a webinar in a while. So thank you, gentlemen, for, uh, for all the insight today. It was, uh, it was awesome. And Brandon, Jeff, quickly, just before we go, uh, best way to get you here is via email or LinkedIn, I assume. Um, and then, yeah, just quickly, uh, you know, for sales and marketing professionals out there that maybe aren't familiar with Handshake or Aircall, uh, how are you guys helping, you know, the sales marketing world today? Sure. Um, so first off, you can reach me uh, on email. That, that, that's fine. LinkedIn, um, certainly a good way. Also, um, if, um, you're, if, if you have to be an SDR and you would like to um, look for roles, um, text messages would be very investigative on your end. Um, so just a little bit about Aircall, I suppose. Uh, we're a cloud-based phone system um, for sales support teams. We've done some uh, other sponsorships with Sales Hacker recently. You might have heard us on like the podcast and such. And um, we really allow teams to be productive and more collaborative from, from anywhere. So we take the phone, get rid of the desk phone, and we're mobile, desktop, um, basically being able to work from anywhere. Um, the main things for us is being able to work seamlessly into uh, any CRM help desk system. Uh, and the integrity of those uh, integrations is really core to the Aircall product, enabling people to essentially, perhaps essentially to eliminate data entry wherever they might be working uh, at any given time. And over the long haul, that's really like the, where the magic comes from. And if you're evaluating phone systems, like this might be something you want to be thinking about because we really think that the future of the business phone is more than just making and receiving calls. It's about getting real-time information. If you're integrating with every solution out there, CRM system, e-commerce system, whatever it might be, uh, and you're able to push that information to reps, to support agents, whatever it might be in the time that they need it, whether it's pre-call, during call, post-call, you can sort of augment conversations and make them much more intelligent and helpful uh, than they once were. Uh, and so that's where we're heading uh, as, a, as a company. If you want to learn more, we have a ton of great sales features across like um, adding lines easily, coaching, uh, coming out with Power Dialer in a couple of weeks. So if you want to learn a little bit more, feel free to reach out to me or um, check us out on the website for any more details on that. Awesome. And Brandon? Yeah, uh, at Handshake, we make e-commerce software. Uh, we make it for uh, B2B uh, specifically. So we work with manufacturers and distributors who want to, uh, who want to bring their manufacturer and distributor business uh, into 2018, uh, really. So uh, B2B tends to evolve about 10 years behind B2C, and uh, you would be remarkably amazed if you didn't work at Handshake how a uh, few companies uh, or how many companies, I should say, still take orders from their retailers on things like faxes uh, and, uh, and voicemails uh, and all of the terrible things that can happen there uh, do, and Handshake solves for that. Uh, we, we help brands stay more connected to the retailers that evangelize and sell their products for them. Uh, you can reach me there, uh, brandon.gracie at handshake.com. Uh, I, I avoid Twitter like the plague, uh, so that's the best possible <laughs> place to get me. Awesome. Well, thank you again, guys. Uh, it was a lot of fun chatting with you, uh, you both. And uh, thank you, the uh, community, for everyone uh, tuning in and staying eight minutes late. Appreciate it. Have, uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Scott.